Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think I have to repeat the same thing. Uh, good morning to each and everyone. I'm Swarna. I'm a nephrologist. And uh, most of us know each other. If not, today will be our start and we'll continue to know each other and discuss about things. I should I should admit I should have uh, I have few disclosures. First thing is I don't claim myself as a specialist in uh, CRRT because I know it's my intensive uh, care colleagues who look after and of course we co-manage. So there's a lot more to learn from from you people. Me. Second thing is I've uh, taken few slides from uh, Dr. Monica Gulati. Uh, she's preparing as well. So and she's a truth. So this will be an overview. OK, our objectives for today. We have, what are we do doing? We are just going to talk about acute kidney injury in ICU. What's happening to hemodynamics in acute kidney injury? Is it really important once patient goes into renal failure? Is it still important to maintain uh, adequate hemodynamics? These are the things which we'll be talking about. and. The most important thing is renal replacement therapy, which encompasses few, which we will discuss as time goes by. Now, I think it, it is not surprising. Most of us have seen this definition, acute kidney injury, and uh, it's, it's the uh, accumulation of waste products, uh, acidosis. The job which kidney does is unable to do, hence it accumulates causing problems. It's as simple as that. And it has started within a short span of time. So it is when this, this is KDGO guidelines, which it's, it's all of us follow, although there are several other criteria which have come. So we see increase in serum creatinine um, more than 0 0.3 within 48 hours or more than 1.5 times within seven days and of course urine output less than 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour so this is all not new I, I don't think we are talking about anything new we know this and it's it's a just a recap now why is it important we know acute kidney injury in critically ill patients is very very common we should admit we see as an outpatient and in uh, in the uh, when we admit the patients, we do see acute kidney injuries. Uh, we call it, we can divide it into community acquired, hospitally acquired. And here in critically in patients, it's more important. It's essentially because there's high mortality and it, it constitutes almost 30 to 60%. If, if I just do an ICU round, you see the patient presents with uh, um, sepsis, with multi organ failure, and kidney is one of those. Uh, um, one of the companion in that uh, um, acute kidney injury. Now, we, we do know the causes. We have a systematic approach, pre-renal, renal, post-renal, which is the way we all, all of us go through. Having said that, why is it very important for us to look through this? We're not uh, keeping aside all the SOFA scoring, the Apache scoring, just having acute kidney injury increases mortality and morbidity. So never, it's never, it's a, it's a beautiful organ. It does a lot of jobs and it, it also takes the same respect. So never to be ignored. So when we follow, once we discharge patients from, you, you discharge from ICU and once they come to the ward, they go home. We still continue to follow because there's always chances of, progression to chronic kidney disease and once they have an insult they're more prone for repeated insults and cardiovascular complications also increases so we we know how important kidneys are now at this point of time I'd like to emphasize that about 20 to 25 percent of cardiac output goes to the kidney so we know how sensitive, how much flow, water, it, how much of perfusion it requires. These biomarkers, I've been reading about this for the last 15 years or so. 
I think it's it's a topic which everyone would be interested in research. We see papers, but how many of us have started using this in our clinical practice? Yes, I think uh, Shashi, when he was in Hobart, probably about 15, 16 years ago, he was involved in this NGAL study. But I still don't see it coming actively into clinical practice. So for us, most of the things is, how is it going to matter to me? How is it going to matter to my patient? This is how we are going to think. I'm just not going to repeat, read everything. Yes, we do have biomarkers. Probably it will come to utility in future. And some places it has some. It's a, it's a good marker because we know, we all know when we are talking about creatinine, we say, oh, yeah, patient, uh, it has half-life of about 3.8 and if kidney function has gone down it can even go to 77 hours so when there is an insult it, we know that it does not pick up easily so and also we know that there are certain it is not only reflection of glomerular filtration it also tubular secretion or tubular excretion so it's not exactly talking about glomerular filtration we all know about this but how much of it we need to think about it. We do, of course, of this, we still do uh, resistive indices when patient comes in with acute kidney injury, we ask for renal Doppler, but is it going to change my clinical practice? Not yet at this stage. Yes, it's nice to know. Um, and there are a few which are on the in the pipeline, which we have not even, we are not even looking at it at this stage. Now, we spoke about kidney being an extremely important organ. It is a good sensor. It takes almost 20 to 25 percent of cardiac output. And when there is reduced perfusion, for whatever reason it is, kidney recruits its own mecha mechanism so that maximum blood flow goes to the brain and heart. I think two important arguments. Of course, we can survive um, with dialysis, even if they have acute kidney injury. We can keep them alive uh, with dialysis. Not the same with lung, not the same with uh, brain. And heart, mm, so, so, yeah, still, these are the two important organs. So I just put some thing, uh, picture here taken from this New England Journal. Although it looks old, still holds good. Recently, Professor Bellam, I was uh, listening to KD Go. We, we do get every week podcast about uh, KD Go new advances. And Professor Bellamo still goes back to this and talks about the same things. Uh, myogenic reflexes, I mean, essentially, whatever it is, it, uh, there is renal vasoconstriction and there is every attempt, increased antidiuretic hormone secretion. This is all an effort to save or to keep water and salt, I mean, to cause salt and water retention. Eventually, to increase, to keep, the, keep up the blood pressure so that our other organ perfusions are looked after. In this process, what are we losing? I mean, these things, sometimes I, I hear from some of my uh, colleagues that patient is on a nephrotoxic uh, telemisarcon. I would admit, I wouldn't call it as a nephrotoxic. It just alters, it just alters the autoregulation in the kidneys. So when we start, when they're in acute kidney injury, yes, we do hold off for a brief period in an attempt to restart as soon as possible. Many times I do start even before they leave the hospital as long as the kidney function is stable. So here, of course, there are a few things which can Compromise renal compensation, which we spoke about, which are already patient has abnormal vascular uh, reactivity or patient is on diuretics or non-steroidals, which interferes with these prostaglandins. And we spoke about the AC inhibitors, ARBs, and of course, hepatorenal syndrome, cardiorenal syndrome. Now, is it, I think, I always see my intensive care colleagues and uh, we asking our in intensive care colleagues, uh, uh, whether it's the nursing staff or uh, uh, the doctors, 
uh, what map are you aiming? And I know they do, right? When during the notes, they do put it as uh, map aim for map of more than 65. So this is a study uh, which is uh, sepsis sepsis uh, study, which is published in New England Journal in 2014, which says it compared map target of 65 to 70 to map target that is mean arterial pressure pressure to 80 to 85. So it was a big study, France, and it it, it looked at uh, uh, it, it was it's it's a good decent study with around 76 uh, around 800 patients and professor godry stephen godry is one of the pioneers in acute kidney injury and he's one of the big contributors for uh, uh, like professor balama he's also one of the big contributors of uh, acute kidney injury management and trials so conclusion so it says that if you're aiming for higher target, it doesn't fetch me anything extra. It doesn't affect the mortality. However, if patient is already, patient has underlying hypertension. Patient always sits with blood pressure of around uh, 160, 170, which is not surprising for renal patients. So in these patients, perhaps it would be helpful to aim for higher mean arterial pressure. And they have found in this study that aiming for higher MAP to around 80 to 85 reduces, lowers doubling of creatinine and uh, need for renal replacement therapy. And this they followed for up to seven days. And uh, if you look at the supplement, they've even followed longer. So this is just to get to our notice that we, we need to emphasize it's not just it's just not a number you're treating a patient so our, the background is very very important so when we are taking history previous antihypertensives already patient is on multiple antihypertensives and i'm just aiming for 65 map might not help so there is this study which is given which is an eye opener for us now we have we, we, we spoke a bit of dynamics. Now we'll go to our next learning objective. What are the things we talk about when we are considering dialysis? So in this, subsequently, we are going to talk about indications for dialysis. And when to initiate? This is, a, this is always a million dollar question. We might disagree with each other, but there are a few studies which have guided us. And now, once you have decided, are we going to Intermittent, continuous, of course, the lifeline is a good access. I think none of us can work without a good access, whether it is dialysis catheter, whether it is fistula for hemodialysis patients who have come to our, whether it's a, uh, hemodialysis patients in unit or they've come to ICU, PD cat peritoneal dialysis catheter. Today's discussion, we are not going to talk about peritoneal dialysis. Of course, if people are interested, we can definitely talk about it. But we will remember that's an option. And anticoagulation and ultra filtration. So this is the framework we are going to discuss. Now, whatever is said and done, uh, sometimes patient might have potassium of 6.2, no ECG changes. We might, I might say, um, let us start dialysis. Dilip might say, oh, let's wait. Why don't we try uh, uh, antihypercalemic medication? So it is always the clinical judgment is superior, and this is never to be underestimated. However, KDGO gives there are certain things which most of us do agree, severe and refractory hyperkalemia, severe and refractory metabolic acidosis, and the same thing, severe and refractory pulmonary edema. It's a bit of a tricky thing when they use the word refractory. How much of hyperkalemic measures have you given? How frequently are you giving? The same with metabolic acidosis. Bicarb ICU study did say that when pH is less than 7.2, you could use uh, bicarbonate. So, but how much? It says maximum of 200 ml. Uh, but sometimes they say we have given bicarb, still patient is acidotic, can we start? 
uh, it's essentially a thing which we decide. And when we are deciding, it's uh, uh, it is you're anticipating because your clinical judgment will tell. Oh, I can see the trajectory not going great. Let me start. It's that's the trend we use when we are looking at dialysis, judging where when you're looking at uh, indication. At this point of time, I get frequent calls from my colleagues uh, uh, asking, this patient has got lactic acidosis, can we start dialysis? There is a study, if, if, uh, previous study from uh, uh, Professor Godry from France, big study. And I, I've also taken this, uh, another journal from clinical journal, in the journal, clinical kidney journal, uh, which says this lactic acidosis is not an indication because it's the consequence. It's not an, it's not an ultimate, I mean, it's an effect, but it's because of something else. Of course, except for when there is metabolic acidosis and there is associated things like if the patient might have taken excess paracetamol, patient might have drunk alcohol, excess alcohol, like uh, uh, being extre extremely depressive, lithium, and uh, this patient might have underlying mal malignancies. Maybe who knows? This patient might have uh, uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia and is going into atra syndrome. So then. It's just not lactic acidosis. We are looking at lactic acidosis, but we are looking at other factors as well. And here we are looking at the trajectory. That's what we are talking about. Now, when to start dialysis? This is this is an argument, even whether it is acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. So we have few uh, randomized control trial, and I've just summed up everything. Most of this, this EDAN study is the first of its kind. It's a single center, German, German study, and it did take few patients. We should note that this is a study which was done in post cardiac surgery, and most of them went into acute pulmonary edema. So, this did favor early renal replacement therapy. The other studies we can see whether it is Akiki 1, Akiki 2, and ideal ICU, it says we could wait. There is there's no difference. Of course, it's barring the clinic acute indications. None of us are going to challenge each other for acute indications. But this is when there is no, maybe patient has got urine output of 400 mild metabolic acidosis. So um, you're just, you're, you, we most of us tend to wait. I get a nice night call saying uh, when I, when, when we have intensivists, it's, it's a luxury, but not every hospital will have an intensivist. So we get calls. So in that case, these trials will definitely help us. So this most of these studies show that there's no difference if you are going to initiate early or late. It's not going to affect. Um, it's it's not going to affect your outcome. Ninety day survival. 28 day dialysis three days. So these were the things which they used. But what is late? What is early? This was looked in this Akiki 2, which did tell perhaps I would wait only for about 72 hours. And I think that's that's it. If I do more than that, I'm taking, I'm risking the patient and taking challenges too much for so more chances of complications. So this study says. If patient is in perigo stage three, malignant for more than seventy-two hours, and this compared blood urea nitrogen of forty and blood urea nitrogen of fifty, and they found that earlier, probably if I waited for longer, more risk of complication. Uh, now, essentially, what it says is probably we can wait for seventy-two hours and then start getting getting ready for dialysis. And most of this, I think we did this. Professor Quadri is a, is a man like uh, he, he does uh, uh, Dr. Professor Osterman, Professor Quadri, Professor Balamo. I think most of us know them. These are not new names for us. No, it's, it's easy. I think many times we, we do talk about let's, let's start dialysis. What are we going to lose about it? So just Watch the space. We, we all know. We all know that 
there's an entity called as acute kidney injury secondary to dialysis whether it's crrt whether you're talking about low pump speech whatever it is there is an entity so this might delay the renal recovery so that's the there is study which which is going to come which is makiki so many kikis happening here so this this will be it's yet to be published however uh, kediko podcast talks about it and it says that uh, uh, this is going to give us clear understanding why not to initiate dialysis early now once now we have got a clear understanding we have we've got a thought about okay i'm going to initiate dialysis now is it crrt is it pd i think we, we spoke we told we're not talking about pd so pro, chronic renal replacement therapy of course if they're hemodynamically unstable that's going to help C crrt is going to help and if they're stable even if they're in icu we could think about ihd intermittent hemodialysis slight it's it's a sort of hybrid where when they're not severely hemodynamically unstable requiring some norad support some vasopressin vasopressin support uh, we can think about slit that is slow uh, efficiency uh, slow low efficiency dialysis never to forget um, in most of the places where we work i think most of the hospitals do not have crrt so we'll be incorporating slit and we will be incorporating the hemodialysis depending on the clinical state of the patient and in uh, some parts in uh, places like france uh, it, it is 50 50% ihd slash crrt in australia most of them uh, go for it's safer in icu they go to crrts uh, and in india we did speak i think we'll be going to more more into this like it's nothing to do it's it's various reasons we have institutional protocols resources it's not crrt as i said initially i'm i'm not i mean um, usually my intensive care team who looks after and we co manage we discuss so it needs special special training and affordability in our country cannot be disregarded it's whatever happens let let us put the patient on crrt it doesn't work like that so all this have to be kept in our mind this is just a picture i think most of us have seen this is crrt and this is intermittent hemodialysis this is a typical we see two uh, two uh, two little uh, cans one is bicarbonate bag one the, the other one would be uh, other electrolytes so essentially goes into dialyzer we are going to talk more about it and crrt various bags it's about 4 liters bag most of us are used to baxter uh, uh, crrt but there are various uh, companies whatever it is i should admit it's a team work it's and nursing staff this this bags 4 liters bags need to be replaced every 4 hours just imagine the the nursing staff work they're the constantly monitoring and they're the ones who tell us when it's interrupted we 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 do see in icu it's not surprising patient goes for some investigation patient might have uh, sudden deterioration so crrt has been stopped so it could be some procedures some investigations uh, so it's the nursing staff are the ones who keep a close eye uh, and they do monitor and let us know when we are calculating what sort of prescription to give so uh, crrt it can be continuous veno venous hemofiltration where it is essentially you're working on hemofiltration and convection which is causing cellular drag so here we are not dialyzing we are just looking at just some fluid removal and we are looking at of course with it there is some cellular clearance as well cvv that is front uh, it is continuous veno venous hemodiafiltration continuous veno venous hemodialysis this is what i'm usually used to and intermittent hemodialysis is what we do as i mentioned 
any modality you talk about, whether it is in the ICU or whether it is in unit or it is a mobile dialysis unit, which is which is an upcoming trend. So essentially, you need the principles work the same. So you have a dialyzer, which is the artificial kidney, if you like to call it, and it has uh, uh, about 8,000 to 12,000 tiny little fibers, which acts like kidney, and through that blood flows and dialysis goes dialysis goes through the opposite in the opposite direction and the diffusion convection ultrafiltration diffusion is from higher concentration if urea is high in the blood it diffuses to the I many high in the blood it diffuses into the filter and it, it convection the ultrafiltration is simple word it's pulling it's just pulling pulling the fluid convection is solute drag when fluid is being pulled it always pulls some solutes with us with it now I just put a slide which which differentiates between the three so usually in dialysis we use blood flow if for a good dialysis i can talk about this intermittent hemodialysis for a good dialysis you need a good fistula radiocephalic fistula is a beautiful fistula most of us like it and normally it has about 700 to 800 ml it can it pump the flow is so much however in indian setups these are for uh, western setups in indian setups most of us set between 200 to 300 mils per minute it doesn't mean that because my fistula because the fistula is having so much of flow i'm going to increase the pulling it this means that blood is being pulled from the arterialized vein and dialysis flow is about 30 liters per hour. So it just means if I'm doing a four hour session, I use about 120 liters of uh, RO water. Um, and we all should remember for RO water, there is almost one is to three waste. So if I have waste is, we call it as reject water. We don't call it as a waste water because this can be used for toilets. This can be used for uh, plants. So the uh, if, if I use about 120, it's approximately around 360 liters goes as a reject. 300 to 360 liters goes as a reject water. So if if I'm sitting as four hour session in Indian setup, four hours is standard. I want uh, to be uh, this to be stuck in the brain just because short dialysis is not quality dialysis, and it needs RO water pipelines and it is less labor intensive uh, usually <clears throat> one uh, we usually have conventionally we don't most of the hospitals doesn't mean we all go by carry go guidelines uh, however it's patient safety cannot be compromised one dialysis technician uh, and one nurse two people can manage approximately about four to six um, patients six patients at least in one shift so it's less labor intensive they keep of course they keep running around keeping in dialysis patients can get sick but it is less sicker than the icu patients who are on crrt and most most of our patients dialysis is done as an outpatient hybrid technique this is a middle technique which comes in between uh, we tend to keep blood flow of around 150 100 to 150 why not lower than that if we keep lower chances of many times we might not give heparin um, blood clotting is higher uh, and uh, clearances are not better essentially you are doing for clearances so higher the pump speed definitely clearances are better but keeping in the patient so we'll remember we are treating the patient not just the urea not just the creatinine and just at this point i would like to mention creatinine is just an innocent bystander it's not really toxic Yes, urea, middle molecules, they can be taken as a uh, toxic metabolite, but creatinine, it's just a marker. And a sled, we can decide, most of us put it about six to eight hours. This also needs RO water, and we use the same machines. There are sled machines as well, but we use the same machines. And uh, yes, this can vary. Uh, this table says it's like, stable, but we can it can vary if you're putting low pump speeds with some vessel pressure support in ICU. Uh, 
quite uh, uh, monitored by a uh, experienced team why not we could still go we do still do sled now crrt this is it, it, we they keep about 100 to 150 and it can go up to 300 depending on the access and uh, it, they they replace four hour bags and it goes 24 hours 24 hours is a number however many times we we it's if there is the interruptions it says 18 to 24 hours is called as chronic renal replacement therapy we all have experience we all know that there is massive interruptions for various reasons we have spoken about this one it is more never intensive they have to be closely monitored for various reasons which we have spoken and which we will be looking this is for unstable oh, i'm sorry i think it's it's uh, not like stable it's unstable i should correct it now many times this question comes in when when patient is in icu stable not on much support can we go give uh, intermittent hemodialysis or when you have looked after in icu your still kidney function has not recovered you're sending to the ward and we'll be managing in the unit so we are transitioning but we are hopeful that kidneys will recover in next few weeks or so so we are transitioning so this is a, a good study which is compared this is again it is looking at both a kiki one and icu uh, ideal icu study this uh, uh, the, the author is still the same so it looked at compared to ihd crrt there is no major survival uh benefits or kidney recovery as long as you're looking after the hemodynamics that's a clause as long as you're looking after hemodynamics and uh, it says this is what it says so if you can read crrt as first modality conveyed no benefit we spoke about it and might be associated with less favorable outcome because probably you're not giving adequate dialysis patient is moving around so many places and uh, there is constant interruptions because if there's no anticoagulation. So this is essentially a non-inferiority study. This is to say that we do have, if patient is hemodynamically stable, you can always ask your nephrologic colleague, do you want to come send your technician to the unit, uh, to the ICU? Because patient needs uh, uh, ICU care for, for whatever reasons it could be. It could be post-operative, it could be a patient is ventilated, but hemodynamically stable, happy. I think we we we, we are well supported. So why why not do intermittent hemodialysis? <clears throat> Lifeline for any dialysis, whether it is uh, continuous renal replacement therapy, whether it is uh, sled or uh, IHD, is a line. If it's a uh, in an acute setting, it's right internal jugular vein is super line i think most of them like like it the nursing staff like subclavian because less alarms but there is chances of subclavian stenosis and thrombosis come more which compared to right internal jugular vein why right internal there's less thinking and at least the length should be 15 centimeter we'll emphasize although there are 16 centimeter lines 20 centimeter lines but at least the length should be 15 centimeter and it should be positioned between svc and right atrium so this is very important um, the reason is sometimes we might put a line which might be shorter and we might not be giving it when you're when you're pulling the blood essentially uh, it's just sucking on the vein so it's you're not getting adequate flows and in emergency circumstances it's not surprising that we put femoral lines but when we are putting femoral lines please make sure the the size of the the length of line is up at least 20 centimeter it should extend beyond common idea when towards the inferior vena cava to give adequate blood flow we did talk about adequate blood flow pump speeds very important for good dialysis, whether it's salute clearance or ultrafiltration. <clears throat> Intermittent hemodialysis, I, it, it's not a, 
uh, it is something which which is the patient has an established AV fistula and the patient has a graft so we can use it so here we we use higher pump speeds we use higher uh, dialysate flow and also we we use uh, um, uh, we aim for higher uh, ultra filtrations as well here i just want to know this is av fistula av fistula is uh, something which the nephrologist loves so it's essentially a, a vein which is being arterialized so if i take it as radial kef and cephalic vein radiocephalic so it is the surgeon connects between the two after some time the vein is almost behaving like an artery although not an artery almost behaving like an artery so that you can have at least a 17 16 17 gauge cannula to go in so that we give good dialysis graft when the veins are too small we use a synthetic material to connect between an artery and a vein when i compare an artery and the, when i compare a fistula and uh, graft fistula is the best graft the next there is high risk although the you can achieve pump speeds of even about 400 500 mils per minute but the life of an av graft is lesser than that of a fistula and also because it can give more uh, it has massive blood flow you should also think about cardiovascular it's it, it increase it puts a lot of pressure on the heart so even that has to be considered when patient comes to ICU. If patient has a fistula, cardio, it's a high output. Many times you can hear something like a murmur. It just means there's increased cardiac output. So if between fistula and a graft, fistula is favorable. And permacaps, that is, uh, it, it is not permanent. Although it's permacap, it's not permanent. It's it's a bridge between. Uh, uh, temporary dialysis catheter so many times many units uh, many hospitals when they're starting that when you're expecting anticipating patient to be on dialysis maybe for about six to eight weeks or so they put uh, a permacap in Indian setup it, the cost constraints might prevent that so one thing I would like to request which all of you know Please do not use AV graft and fistula for CRRT because the pump speed is too slow and you just, and already patient is hypotensive. So there's a risk of thrombosis. So kindly do not use, even if patient has a fistula, please get a access a dialysis catheter and start CRRT. Now we have spoken about access. Now coming to fluid removal. How much fluid removal? KD go recommends about 30 ml per kg per hour. I think it's it's a bit too much. A recent study has found out it also which which shows net ultrafiltration rate and renal recovery among critically ill patients who are receiving this renal replacement therapy. It is an observational study understanding all the the drawbacks of observational study. Still, I think it's it, it's still in clinical context we do agree so we'll go with it so this looked at removing about one this is three different things the lower one is looking at fluid less than fluid removal one mil per kg per hour the red one is one to 1 1.75 ml per kg per hour so if it's an eight sorry if it's an 80 kg individual it's about 80 ml per hour this would be 1.7, um, maybe around 1, 180 or so. And this is more than 1.75 ml per kg per hour. So this is a study which shows, and here you can see there is renal re rate of renal recovery at 90 days is higher when you have removed less fluid. Although it's a paradox, we do know that we are in ICUs, we aim for uh, negative balance uh, because we know that uh, positive balance has high mortality. Doesn't mean you're going to pull out the fluid immediately. That's the reason we have we go for uh, frequent dialysis, continuous renal replacement therapy. So this is a study which shows, and 
this is a strong study which shows that when I remove too much of fluid, there is less chances of renal recovery. It's not only renal recovery, it is also survival. So we, I'm thinking about both. So it's here, this, this one, pro probability of dialysis independence. And uh, this one, I, I think I've missed one slide. I've lost one slide, which also looks at survival. So fluid removal should be carefully judged. In dialysis setups, uh, in intermittent dialysis setups, we get a call. Patient comes in with fluid overload. Can I remove six liters? So it, can I remove five liters? So it doesn't fit in like that. We are guided by certain things. Aim for ultrafiltration, 10 mils per kg per hour. So it's this is most of us do. However, many times, when we know the patient, we try to do a bit more than what we could if they're really fluid overloaded, because, and more so when it is a long dialysis gap. So what it just says is one size. I cannot tell that one size fits everything, everyone. So it's, it's always repeated assessments and follow the trajectory. We know what, what has happened. Last time when I tried to remove uh, about 80 mils per hour, just because uh, it says one mil per, per kg per hour doesn't mean I'm going to remove 80. If patient is hypotensive, I might even go lower. So just it's your clinical judgment. These are just the guidelines. So now, why why are we so much worried about this? Yes, we spoke about uh, acute kidney injury related to uh, artificial kidney, that is dialysis. Uh, why? There is we, we all know about this. There is. Intradialytic hypotension, whether it is in ICU setups in a hemodynamically unstable or whether it is hemodynamically stable patients, still it is it increases mortality. So we will always keep it in back of our mind. So this is the study, which is for this is the intermittent intradialytic hypotension in this study was taken as less than 90 a is about one is less than 30 i think one is below uh, less than one is less than 10 percent the other one is below 30 percent of the baseline what the patient came in with and no intradialytic hypotension so here you can see look at this so again this there is survival uh, thing and uh, uh, there is also mortality there's definitely mortality benefit. Now, can we prevent? Of course. Can we do better? Definitely we can do better. There is now we in, in our clinical practice, we do use in ICU setups, you, you have mean arterial pressure, which guides. Of course, we know the reasons this mean arterial pressures can change, but still it's a guide. We have sent CVP monitoring, which which is less utilized now. Cardiac output monitoring, although cumbersome because patient is on ventilator, you need special expertise. Now there is talk a lot about renal perfusion pressure. So even this, we are going to, uh, Professor Balamo is doing some studies on renal perfusion pressure. So this he's looking at. Uh, so very soon, we're going to hear something about it. And uh, we have blood volume monitoring. Most of our dialysis uh, the Baxter ones or Fresenius ones has blood volume monitoring. It tells us uh, the rate of uh, uh, ultrafiltration, and we know not to increase too much because we know it increases mortality. And now I'm talking to the tele group, tele intensive group, who you probably will have more idea where, in, in fact, there is this, this study is again, uh, it's been published recently. So re real-time prediction of intradialytic hypotension using machine learning and cloud computing. So it is essentially looking at the trajectories, what happened when we removed, uh, where, when blood volume dropped, when, uh, when we removed, when we increased the hematocrit. So looking at various things, this is going to give us an idea how much it's a guide. So probably the team, our team, could look into, into this. Anticoagulation, 
never to be underestimated. It's not required for dialysis. However, it's required to maintain the extracorporeal circuit. So, uh, and also at every stage, you should be thinking how to minimize the complications. So, which anticoagulating anticoagulants to use? Most intensivists use um, Cipret, and need special training. The nurses check ionized calcium. They keep replacing. They check the lactate levels. The and uh, in ICU setup, it's not a difficult thing to uh, do liver function tests. So they, they they have they're specially trained to look into it. So citrate, yes, it's better in ICU setup. Heparin can be given. Any anticoagulant is okay as long as we are looking at as long as we are monitoring for complications. And heparin with protamine on one side, I'm giving just before it enters into a dialyzer, you can give heparin. And before it goes into the patient, uh, uh, produce protamine. It's just a binder, but it's not. It's it's not very trendy. Not many of us like it because pro we see protamine is really short acting, and uh, it, again we can see reflux. I mean, after some time, there can be rebound coagulopathy. There can be cardiotoxicity. So this is not something which uh, most of us like, and I have. Absolutely no experience with heparin with protamine, but happy to be involved when people when my my colleagues are. So how do we increase filter life? So we could try. We can look at at every stage. Every yesterday patient required CRRT filter clogged off, so you stop dialysis. Today, can we look at intermittent hemodialysis? So can we look at uh, uh, may perhaps today shorter dialysis again do it tomorrow so look at various options we can work around we 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 always we in medicine we always have what is plan a plan b the same thing here you're going to look and if if the hemodynamics tolerate is it possible to increase the pump speed and pre-dilution replacement fluid it just because it increases if i'm um, Say when I dilute before it goes into dial, dialys dialyzer, there is more dilution so that the, the tiny little fibers do not clot. And there are some anticoagulated cold coated filters which could be available in a few places. And you should never forget medications which we use. Are they going to? Except uh, ICU patients themselves are so dynamic. And every day, what you've spoken about half an hour ago is completely different. So we look at various factors about with regards to medication. So I've, I've mentioned, but few things: body weight. We look at the al serum albumin and uh, whether this the medication which we are using uh, is uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic, and is it dialyzable, non-dialyzable? If they're on dialysis. So many factors to consider. So I put few medications here, which we commonly use. Beta lactams. Yes, these are hydrophilic, so more it can be dialyzed. And hydrophobic, like if I have to give linozolid, I don't do suggest it. So mm -hmm. fluoroquinolone, ciprofloxacin, usually not really. So just just for us to remember, it's hard to go through everything, know everything. It's a vast topic. Because if we, if we have the luxury of a uh, pharmacist, that's the best. They would guide us, look, you're, you're underdosing the patient. Because in ICU setups, underdosing is more common than overdosing. So they might tell. And patient might be on vancomycin. So uh, the, 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 it, is, it, 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 it is dialyzable. So uh, you might have to post dialysis. You might have to give an extra dose. Answer to this, keeping aside all this, Therapeutic drug monitoring. If we have, if we have a, uh, an option for that, that would be an amazing option. Few things, few other things which I've uh, written here: midazolam, lorazepam, fentanyl, morphine, which are used commonly in ICUs. They're not uh, dialyzable. However, their metabolites are dialyzable. So from this, what at least uh, things which we have learned is it's a Thoughtful when we are deciding on renal replacement therapy, we have so many things in the back of the mind. Uh, many times we have an argument. Uh, one nephrologist 
one intensivist waits for a bit longer time, the other nephrologist starts dialysis earlier. It could be because of experiences, but we have more answers from various trials. But renal replacement uh, therapy is always a thoughtful, multimodal assessment, and it's a teamwork. At every stage, we are looking at renal recovery and survival. If it is uh, acute kidney injury, and if it is already dialysis patients, anuric, we are looking at survival, of course. And even if even once they have established acute kidney injury, or if it's more than seven days, what you what we call it as acute kidney disease, still maintaining hemodynamics is very, very important because we're talking about renal perfusion pressure and renal recovery is better when they have better hemodynamics. And acute and chronic kidney disease, uh, avoid nephrotoxins. We, we always, none of us remember all the medication, none of us remember uh, all the uh, drugs which are metabolized. Uh, we might remember the common ones, but at every stage, look, think if it's a nephrotoxin and do the drug calculation. We can use the uh, drug calculation uh, book, so we don't have to remember everything. Nursing care, I would say, never underestimate it. Uh, and course those calculation early uh, early I mean nutrition is something which takes a back seat especially in uh, our our setups in our country so then they, it's in fact a high high metabolic state so good nutrition high protein diet and those calculation we spoke about and early mobilization if safe to do so so these are some things which we would take I didn't go into the intricacies of Shoot, troubleshooting with regards to uh, pump speeds, with regards to alarms, because it's it's out of the, it, it is a massive topic by itself. Sir, I think you are mute, sir. I am on mute, am I? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, I am on mute. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah you have done a very good presentation, Dr. Sorna. It is very uh, uh, up to date, uh, evidence based uh, advice. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. My, yeah, my question, question was, uh, uh, some people in foreign countries advise three times a week dialysis, and uh, but here it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, what? How do you man manage that uh, scenario here? And how do you manage uh, twice a week dialysis rather than thrice a week dialysis? That's one question. And the, next, the second question is the CRRT, you, know, you said the dose is 30, 30 ml per kg per hour. Uh, what happens if you give too much, uh, like 40 mils per kg per hour? Is there any delayed uh, um, recovery of the kidney, or is it a problem, or is it not a problem? These two questions. Thank you. Very good question, Doctor. What is your doc? Uh, what's your name, Doctor? I, I'm Ramamurthy. I'm an anesthetist intensivist. <laughs> I do go no. and uh, yeah, I do visit UK often. So, oh, uh, great, great. I have, I have yeah. Dr. Ramurthy, really nice to meet you. Okay, first question about uh, in our setup, I think we have we we are restrained by few things. Uh, of course, cost is never to be underestimated. There was a study which came out, which which did mention that uh, uh, escalation depending on urine output is no non-inferior. Let us not put it as superior, non-inferior. So most of us in India, we still are happy to go ahead with twice weekly and uh, based on the urine output if urine output is good yes and if clearances are good we calculate urea reduction ratios and other uh, kt by v is the other thing which we measure it should be at least more than 1.4 and uh, 1.3 is steady go and urea reduction more than at least 65 so if you are satisfying that is a number again and if patient is clinically well, eating well, uh, hemoglobin stable, keeping in, uh, you're giving erythropoietin stimulating agent and uh, not really acidotic, not really sarcopenic, we are okay. There was definitely one study which said there's no harm uh, going ahead with uh, uh, escal uh, escalations depending on clin clinical progress. So, we start with twice, twice, week, twice weekly, then as urine comes down, many times patients themselves declare, declare. Initially, they'll be refusing, but then they come with two or three presentations with acute pulmonary edema and uh, 
emergency dialysis in ICU. I think all the money which has been saved before has gone. And uh, they know okay. the seriousness. So that is one, if, uh, number one question. Even in, uh, in Australia, in UK, I think it's four hours. In Australia, we use five hours dialysis. Even between the setup, ANZSN recommends five hours dialysis thrice. More dialysis, better. That's the principle. However, keeping other things. Some hospitals, because of even in uh, Australia, they do four hours dialysis. As long as you're looking after the clinical status of the patient and the, the clearances markers. That's number one question. Number two question. This is... Uh, uh, this is KDGO recommends 30 mils. Essentially, it's uh, 25 is the upper limit of normal. 30 mils it has kept. It's because we understanding the interruptions which happens in ICU. So keeping that, you give a grace. So if we do, again, we did see more ultrafiltrations. It increases mortality. And you see, you would be probably pushing when you're removing more fluid, you're giving more of fluid. So increases mortality and renal recovery i think we have clear studies to state that so for preferably try to go even sometimes we do it's just for clearances you might not even remove fluid it's just you just want urea might be around uh, 50 or uh, in our second five six thirty around 250 300 just for clearances you're doing you might not be removing any fluid at all so it is a clinical decision, but that that is an answer. And our study uh, did suggest that for survival and renal recovery, try to minimize fluid re re removal. OK, so you would stick to 30 mils, uh, preferably, uh, to avoid complications. OK, thank you. And uh, for this uh, uh, dialysis, you said when the urine output comes down, you'll go for thrice a weekly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. So when when we are yeah, talking, I'm... yeah. Uh, sorry. Can I? Do you have one more question? No, no, no. I'm I'm not a nephrologist, but I have a dialysis <laughs> unit in my hospital. <laughs> okay. It's, it, 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 it's super that you have a dialysis unit. So what happens is when we when we start patients on dialysis, I think you, you just stop me if I'm re repeating what you already know. When we start patients no, no, on no. dialysis, yeah, dialysis. Still, the dialyzer, which we think is doing a great job, it does only 10 to 15 percent of what our kidney function does. And most of our dialyzers do not clear middle molecules. So for us, preserving that residual kidney function, even if they're passing about 250 mils of urine, it has mortality benefit. If I have a patient who has been on dialysis for two hours, sorry, for two years, who has about 300 ml of urine, the other person who's been on dialysis with the same com comorbidities who has about 50 ml of urine, the fellow with 250 ml of urine with the same uh, comorbidities lives longer. So the middle molecule clearance, this is a trend which every nephrology conference talks about. In that one well-known is beta-2 microglobulin. There are many which we don't know. We should admit that medicine is not something which we all know. So they're still looking into what are the other things. But beta-2 microglobulin, kidney clears. And now the new high flux dialyzers are clearing. So they're looking into that. But still, it has its own disadvantages. Because it removes B12. It removes water-soluble vitamins. So albumin. So we, 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 we come to terms as mid medium cutoff dialyzers, where you're, you're talking between the two. You've come somewhere in between, and you've sat there. One last question. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not uh, wanting to get the chance for this. Uh, the, uh, the reusable filters, uh, reusable filter versus single use filters. I sometimes advise single use filters if patients are affordable. Uh, is there any mortality difference on uh, multi use uh, and single use filters? No, I think until pre COVID, there is no, I mean, it, uh, you, you know, when it's an affordable society, you, you definitely prefer uh, single use. Because we know as uh, yeah. there is definitely coating of the fibers, you yourself will start seeing the blood flow, the filters beeping a lot, and the clearance is coming down with reusable. But, if, but we yeah. do know KDGO does not say don't use reusable. So you could, okay. keeping other things in mind. However, uh, Fresenius has 
uh, like polymed uh, i would prefer like the, the between the various filters presidious is better compared to the polymed polymed single use is better because the clearances with regards to clearances so what happens in many hospitals is uh, they do 10 times 15 times so preferably okay. not i think try to you you would know you your alarm start beeping and you would know the uh, the mm. negative pressures happening so you you don't want your, you want to give good dialysis you want to improve your patient survival that's what you're looking at sure 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 so you said the presidious is better or the polymer is better for no for single uh, for presidious is more expensive but but, uh, but it has it is better it is it tolerates better with regards to reuse uh, polymer before covid i used to me it is uh, in the hospital where i work we used to use uh, uh, reuse presidious ones uh, and we, i used to take extra care that they don't keep reusing of course it's good for the uh, for the economic side of it but not good for the patient yeah. uh, but now after covid luckily i could convince the management for single use presidious is more expensive and uh, poly polymed is uh, less expensive there is dora there are various companies so it's not uh, yeah. one company yeah okay <laughs> Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sorna. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramurthy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Dr. Sanat has a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, I know it's late, but... It's no hey. problem, Sanat. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Yeah. 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 So can we plan another day, uh, probably a talk on how to prescribe for CIRT? Why not? Love to. And uh, probably get ATV ratio also. We'll do that. Yeah. Uh, I think we could do it together. I think uh, not yeah. an issue at all. I would love to. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And ECMO, with ECMO and all those things, uh, there's so much to talk. I think uh, medicine itself is so vast. Yes. <laughs> any any. Do you use, uh, do you use a citrate filter in your practice, Dr. Sorna? Uh, for hemodialysis, no. Heparin or uh, Clexane, uh, Citrate uh, for only for CRRT, yes, we use uh, as long as I, that is for CRRTs. And Citrate because, I, I, I mean, it's with, with regards to calcium and monitoring the side effects, it's very, very tricky. So Citrate, yes, definitely for CRRT. And uh, um, we also use uh, Pondaparinex. So in IHD, I think we have a lot of room to play around. but. I think it's okay. better to stick with citrate in CRRT. Okay. And my experience Thanks. is with regards to the same. And I should say that when I'm locking, sometimes permacat lockings, I, I do lock with citrates when heparin is not doing its job. So there is a thing. I, I can't give you strong evidence, but there is gent with citrate, which comes uh, when permacat is really playing up. I use gent citrate locks, which is citrate. And I know it's just sitting in here, so I'm not too much worried about calcium. Anyhow, our dialysis patients, we check calcium phosphate every every month. So it and I have not seen it dropping the calcium. It's just a citrate lock for permacats. Okay. It has worked. It has worked really well for me for perma, troubling permacats. Okay. So how do you use a landmark for uh, putting your perm cut? You know, it's difficult to find out the RA SVC junction. Uh, just a it small is, question before. Sorry. No yeah. problem. I think it's just as most of us, it, it is, it is all, you know, uh, you, you do, you keep doing and you start learning. I think that's what we all do. Learning. That is the same with our medicine. So it's just, like, okay. I, uh, okay. I, uh, I mean, essentially, we use the nipple, keep the thing, and aim for what curve you're looking at. And that's exactly what we'll be doing. And if things are not going right, this time, if, okay. if it's not happy, next time I would be better. OK. OK, that's great. Thank you. I just comment on the uh, Hi, doctor. This is Dilip here. Dilip, uh, yes, Dilip. We, How we are have you? Ult ultrasound availability, right? For yes. I mean, do we? So, uh, landmark guided, I mean, mo most places, if we have a vascular ultrasound, uh, we can be fairly certain about our uh, dip location, right? Yes, yes. 
I think uh, ultrasound guided. I'm trained with ultrasound guided uh, 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 vas vascular access, but tip location. I'm not sure. I think we still wait for uh, uh, X-rays. But at least I know that it's going into. You have not hit the carotid, and it's just going into the internal jugular. So ultrasound guided is definitely safer, and it keeps it keeps you stress free. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure about the tip position because I've not used. I've uh, whether I've, I'm not really trained to look at the cardiac. Uh, um, I, I should admit. So I still wait for uh, X-ray, and most of the times we have C-arm where we definitely look at the tip, and it's easier. I yeah. um, before, so before I see. this is a good point. Actually, we did a very very small sixty patient RCT on uh, this back in training. Uh, I can share the paper where uh, it, it takes two operators, but with two operators you can actually identify the tip in about seventy uh, percent of the cases with ultrasound alone. Uh, oh, okay. Using the guide wire and and it's actually a pretty interesting technique. I'll I'll share it with you. That's and great. I think, yeah, and I think they used that technique and then added another one where they're completely avoiding the X-ray and just using ultrasound, obviously at the time of insertion and then uh, checking the position uh, was possible. So I'll I'll share that paper with you. It's just an interesting way to do it. Thank you so much because I'm used to. We need to go through the uh, training. Uh, to identify the tip, uh, which is with CR, definitely not ultrasound. That will be, I'll, I'm looking forward for that study. Will do. I did it as a fellow, so I'll share it with you. I think it's time to wind up. I think I took long, really long time. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hope the session was thank useful. You. <laughs> thank you. Very useful. Yeah, thank you.